In this lecture, uh, we're going to do something that, from the viewpoint of many people, is just simply outrageous. Uh, we're going to move from uh, two figures who at least have some things in common, and that's uh, uh, Foucault and Habermas, both of whom deal with the problems of what I've called modernity, and I hope that word hasn't thrown you too bad. It's not such an abstract word. It means the processes by which factories were instituted based on the division of labor and the processes by which institutions came to be rationalized, rule-governed across the whole terrain of our social life with few exceptions. That's the, the process that I've been referring to as modernity. And far from being abstract, it's a part of our every, everyday life. It's called work. It's called hooking up the telephone. It's called applying for a job. It's called dealing with the IRS. This is modernity. It, 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 so don't get lost in the fanciness of the word. That's modernity. Uh, I've, I've argued that uh, it has these pathologies. Foucault has argued it's had them. We've also argued that it has an upside. And I mentioned uh, in an earlier lecture that it's better to have a toothache in the modern world than before. It's also better, I mean, in, across a whole spectrum of, of uh, medical problems and other kinds, it's probably better now than it was then. Certainly, if you want to get from here uh, to uh, California, it's better now because it's much faster, although even that's probably debatable. In any case, uh, with that, uh, with a little bit of tie-up of the other lectures, let me begin with this outrageous attempt to try to deal with uh, perhaps one of the uh, trickiest and strangest philosophers, uh, if he is a philosopher, uh, around today, and that's Jacques Derrida. Uh, I think his name has become synonymous with a kind of evil among many analytic American uh, logic-chopping philosophers. I mean, Derrida is responsible in many ways for deconstruction, that dreaded enemy that has invaded our literary departments that according to popular mythology tells us that any way to read a book is as good as any other that there's nothing outside books that we're always reading, and every reading is a misreading, and so on. Now, in my view, Derrida believes none of these things that I've just outlined. I'm, I'm trying to give you the popular demonizing mythology about Derrida. Uh, I've brought in just one of his books uh, today to show you, but he's written many. Uh, this is Margins of Philosophy. Its title is very significant for Derrida's project, which is to examine philosophy as a broad, long-standing cultural institution stretching back to the Greeks, and to try to do so in a framework that reminds us that philosophy so understood is a, the product of Indo-European languages, to the extent that we know what that phrase means, and the product of Western civilization. It is not an eternal project in the mind of God, you know, but of a, a, a project with a certain materiality, a certain history, and that many of the most interesting things that we will find out about philosophy won't be from reading it badly or from saying any reading of a book by a philosopher is as good as any other, but will be by paying attention to the very things the philosopher tried to repress in his text, the things that the philosopher tried to put on the margin, as it were, of the text of philosophy, the things that the philosopher wished to exclude. By drawing our attention to these, Derrida, in some ways, is like Freud. See, Freud wanted to investigate things like slips of the tongue, jokes in the relation to the unconscious, and so on. In a way, uh, Derrida's metaphilosophical project is to investigate philosophies, slips of the tongue, philosophies, unconscious witticisms, and so on. So this is not an unworthy project. And it is rooted in a profound concern with an earlier figure that we discussed at not nearly enough length, and I won't have nearly enough time 
to do justice to Derrida now. I just want, if I can dispel a few myths about him, I will have done some good in the world. Because I, I, even a brief meeting with me convinced me that he was just a fairly jolly French person and certainly not out to tear up the American university system. And that the image by right-wing lunatics conjured up of lesbian deconstruction literary critics dancing at Brown University, burning Chaucer and Shakespeare, is utterly a fantasy of paranoid dimensions that surpasses anything that the John Birch Society ever dreamed up. Derrida is an academician, he is a very careful reader, and he has some unorthodox views about language and about the history of philosophy. And since I have at least one very good friend who knows his work well, I will draw on some of Lewis Mackey's remarks today, and I will also draw on the Americanized version of uh, Derrida that has been presented to us by Richard Rorty. Now, I'm not saying Rorty fully sus subscribes to everything Derrida says, but Rorty is one of his American admirers. To the extent that he is, that is, as it were, put Rorty in the enemy camp as well, which he is to many analytic and, and positivist-minded philosophers. Rorty is one of the enemy. It's kind of hard, since Rorty's uh, uh, closest philosophical analog would be uh, Dewey. In a way, uh, he's, he is a very American. And uh, in, in certain ways, Derrida is more American than the Brits that we use as our models for much of the analytic philosophy we do. I'll try to explain that as I go along. Okay, let me give you something that I was asked for by a reporter from the Chicago Tribune who was covering the debate over deconstruction, and he went, what the hell is this stuff anyway? So this is... This 45-minute uh, this, uh, uh, lecture to an hour will be an attempt to answer that reporter's blunt question. What the hell is this stuff anyway that's causing so much trouble? I'm going to try to answer that. Well, deconstruction as a term originates uh, in Heidegger's project that I've already discussed, where I said that, that Heidegger wanted to perform a deconstruction of metaphysics, a deconstruction of it not a destruction, but a deconstruction. In other words, to sort of dig through it, underneath it, to read it in such a way that he could uncover, in some sense, the hidden history of being. Now, as his project prog progressed, and that's being with a capital B, I just used, as, as, as Heidegger's project progressed, it became more and more obvious to him that it was futile. That being is, being with the big B is, blank, was a blank that was going to be difficult to fill in. So in the very late Heidegger, when he wrote the word being, he drew a line through it, like that would help. He had write the word where you could read it, but he'd draw a line through it which he called writing being under erasure. Now the point of that was this. This is its connection to modernity and the things we've been discussing, including the self. In the medieval period, beings, entities like us, found our meaning in being and ultimately in the being, the highest being. In fact, philosophers, I sometimes think, when they use the word being with a big B, mean something like God, but just aren't straightforward enough to say it. It certainly seems, I mean, in a certain way, that seems to be the case. Uh, well, Derrida is a step beyond Heidegger. Derrida has noticed, as one could hardly fail to notice, that the history of Western metaphysics has been filled with the attempts to answer the question, being is blank, and to fill in the blank. And if you follow the history of Western metaphysics, being is the demiurgos, being, being is God, being is whatever is uncovered by the empirical science, being is sciences, being is this, uh, being is non-existent, whatever we've tried to fill in the blank with, 
we have not yet reached closure. That's why I said that uh, philosophy is a funny endeavor. It has a 2,500 year, uh, uh, year history of failure, and yet it continues. So obviously, it's not quite in the spirit of capitalism to engage in this enterprise. It's a long time to run a failing business, 2,500 years. Derrida has noticed that this won't, this won't be, this blank can't be filled in. Being is, can't be filled in. The blank won't be filled, can't be filled in. Why not? I mean, we want an argument. We don't want this. I mean, the first thing is that we've noticed that no one's ever successfully filled it in. That's the first thing we notice. That, you know, the history of philosophy has not yet presented us with final wisdom, total coverage, and ultimate truth. We know that, so that's step one, is to know that. Deconstructive readings try to work this out in detail, case by case. You know, a different attempts to answer it and how they fail to answer it. And so deconstructive readings are not a, a single technique or even a special set of techniques. They're more like housework. See, philosophy is not like building a house where you start with a firm foundation and build it up and you're finished and you walk off and that's philosophy. Philosophy under the heading of deconstruction is housework, which means every day the floor is to be swept again. The dishes have to be done again, and I'll be damned the next day it's just like that again, and it's just like that again, and it's just like that again. So deconstruction, if I wanted to compare it as a practice to some other practice, it would be housework. It doesn't get finished. In fact, that is at the heart of, I think, the best of philosophy in the late 20th century is the idea that it's not getting finished and it can't be. Why have philosophers failed to answer the question being is blank, or to fill in the blank? What is being with a capital B? Well, Derrida's take on metaphysics, as I say, is this insight that they failed to, to answer the question but he also has a certain take on language. It's not exactly a theory of language because Derrida thinks one of those is still to be completed and it's still part, the language we speak now is still part of our metaphysical heritage. I mean, we use metaphysical phrases all the time even when we don't think we do. We say, uh, that horse appears to me to be lame and then we've invoked, you know, the concept of appearance with its long philosophical history. Or you can be a, a baseball scout and say, that kid has the potential to hit 300, and now we've invoked the metaphysical language of potentiality with its 2,500 year history. So for Derrida, our language is chipped through with metaphysical moments, fragments in our language. There's no way around it. And in that sense, Derrida certainly wouldn't say that he has avoided metaphysics. The reason he wouldn't say that is that he speaks a language. What he wants to do is to get a better take on why the language can't solve the problem that is central to metaphysics and ontology, the problem of answering the question of what is being. Now, here's the take. It is the nature of language. And Derrida takes it to be something quite other, language to be quite other than what many, many other philosophers and linguists take it to be. And this is going to be very difficult to do in a short time, but I'm going to try. For Derrida, language is not, and I'm, I'll have to do this through a series of negations first, language is not constituted by reference, which is a standard positivist account. In other words, what constitutes reference would be I use the word horse to refer to the horse. Of course, that makes it sound as though what would constitute my talk, that it refers, namely, to the world, would be that I am speaking about some present horse. My word stands for that horse. Now, you may have noticed there's no horse up here with me. Derrida has noticed that. Words do not stand for things. They stand in for them. Let me make that distinction again. Words do not stand for things. They stand in for them. I, 
the word, the, the, the noun, horse, is convenient. Like the noun fly, the noun uh, uh, potato, or, or the word potato chip, the phrase cow chip, the name uh, uh, Neil Bush, because I have all these words, I don't have to carry a kit bag of all the entities in the universe to point to when I talk. I mean, in other words, the, the theory of reference makes it think, make us think as though what's re referred to has to have a kind of presence. Derrida, as usual, engages in, and this is a, a usual deconstructive practice, a kind of reversal. Interestingly enough, that word gets its meaning not from the presence of the horse, but from his absence. Now, it also doesn't get its meaning in isolation. Words are not atomic bits of anything. Words are part of systems of speech. Let me try to make that clear, the way Derrida looks at it. Systems of language. Let me take chess as an example, a famous example, one used by Wittgenstein. If I take a pawn off the chessboard and just put it here, you'll still know that it's a pawn, but it won't be able to make any pawn moves. To make the right moves, it'll have to be on a chessboard and deployed in a game. In other words, there'll be conditions within which it'll make sense to move the pawn two squares forward. One of them won't be to set the pawn on this thing and say, I'm going two squares forward because looking ahead of me, I don't know what would count. Is that a, a square? You know, in other words, it's just not the way the game is played. With systems of languages, they are constituted by the way the words work in these sets of constitutive rules, which frequently overlap and are holistic. For that system to work, the objects so referred to do not have to be present. In fact, I have just gave you, uh, tried to give you an example in which I have pointed out that it is the absences of objects that make the use of nouns and languages interesting. I mean, that's fascinating that we can come in here and discuss an entire basketball series without having Charles Barkley or anyone present. This is an indication that absence is one of the constitutive features of language. Okay, another and, and important thing to remember is this. I don't want to commit the bad abstraction to which philosophy has fallen victim so often by treating language as something other than the following sets of things. It is a system, but it, is a, it has materiality. Language is phonetic sounds that can be heard in finite lengths, measured and so on, and it is marks, sensible marks on paper. and. Here we will attack another view of language. I mean, again, a lot of Derrida's remarks are negative concerning other views of language. Just like reference couldn't be what gives our words their meanings and our uses of them and so on, neither can intentionality of speaker. Now, let me try to use one of Derrida's famous examples. I draw up a grocery list for my wife. I write it down in sensible marks. These are the things we need. Toilet paper. We need stuff for the kids, you know, with candy. And, and then, of course, cash so that we can buy fast food for supper. It's a <laughs> standard way of shopping. I leave the grocery list, and I drive away, and I'm killed utterly. I'm run over by a bus, flattened like a tortilla. My wife comes in. And can my message function in my radical absence? Yes. She can still go to the store, buy the kids food, and maybe only later will they notice. Where's dad? And then they hear on the news, you know, overweight philosopher flattened by truck, tortilla. It, those signs can work in my radical absence. Now. Can they work if I had no intentionality at all in writing them? Yes. Suppose I wrote them three months ago with the intention, or not, well, let me make it even a simpler example. Suppose I wrote them that afternoon with the intention of having my wife leave the house so I could call a lover. 
Would that, would that make the list ineffective because my intention was misunderstood? No. Many philosophers have wanted to tie meaning to what the speaker and our language user intends. But words have their functions. They're, to use Derrida's phrase, they're disseminating meanings apart from those intentions. Now, th let's don't caricature his claim. This does not mean that we cannot intend. We can, but it means we cannot fix meaning by our intentions. This is very important when we read a text by an author in philosophy, because we are frequently led to ask the question, what did he intend to say? And a deconstructive reading will lead us in the direction of not what did he intend to say, but what are these physical marks? How can I interpret these physical marks? To, give, to make that, to use that example, and that, by the way, is an anti-hermeneutic remark. It's a remark sort of against what might be called the idea that there could be the right interpretation. This is, this is another important part of Derrida's take on language and language practices the idea that there could be the right interpretation. In a way, there's no more powerful idea in the discipline of philosophy than the idea that there can be the right interpretation. After all, it's that idea that allows us to give our students B's and C's as opposed to the A's we would make if we had written the paper. It's what keeps us, it seems, continually reading Aristotle and so on in order to get them right, finally. Derrida makes the outrageous claim that in the last analysis, there is no such thing as the right reading, the right interpretation. There is no interpretation that can bring interpretation to an end. Good books, really great texts, do not cut off interpretation. They lead to multiple interpretations. Great examples of this would be the Bible, which I think is pretty obvious, has not yet reached closure on interpretation. I, mean, you know, I, I grew up in a community where there were, there were Baptists, Methodists, Church of Christ. It took me a while to get into the city and meet Jewish people, Muslims, others. It became clear to me that reading the Old Testament it was difficult to come up with the right interpretation. And what was wrong was the very idea that there could be the right interpretation. Now, the converse is the claim that people find outrageous, but it's not made by Derrida. That means since there's no the right way, then any way is as good as any other. Now, it, Derrida is not, uh, is not compelled to hold that view, and he doesn't. Not every way to speak and or read is as good as every other. And let me just put it simply. No one holds that view. Derrida, to the extent that he refuses to play a standard philosophical game, just will not play. The fact that there is no final book, you know, one last master encyclopedia containing all the wisdom of Total coverage, final knowledge, the last book, no, none other ever needs to be written. Derrida considers that a reductio ad absurdum of the idea of perfect interpretation, the right interpretation. This does not at all mean that we don't, in loose, rough and ready ways, judge interpretations all the time. And this does not at all mean that, practically speaking, some interpretations are obviously slightly better than others. Let me return to familiar ones like the traffic light. If it's red and you see it as green, the outcome can be disastrous. Derrida doesn't deny it. No. It's a bad misreading. Bad misreading. But uh, th this, is an, this is a familiar mistake, and it's made about a lot of Derrida's work. Philosophers call someone a relativist by which they mean it's a person that holds that any view is as good as any other view. 
My simple response to that is this. That is a straw person argument. No one in the world believes it or ever has believed it. No one, Derrida or anyone else, believes that every view is as good as every other view. That's only a view we discuss in freshman philosophy class in order to quickly refute it. I mean, no one believes it. There are no defenders of the view. And since this tape will be going out, if we run into one, it will be interesting. But we will likely find that person in one of the institutions that Foucault discussed rather than in some seminar, okay? I mean, that's where we'll find them, if anybody believes that. Now, Derrida's kind of slippage is to remind us that the text of philosophy is not fixed, cannot be fixed. It is of the nature of the text of philosophy and its relation to language that we cannot fix it once and for all. In a way, it's like the, sh the leaky ship uh, where we haven't got anything to stop the leak, so we just keep bailing. I mean, the leak is in the language. One way to give you an analogy that may make it come alive and be simpler for you, and that's been hard for me to do with a philosopher who's very difficult like Derrida, is to think about it in the context of the way that Augustine attempted to develop a rhetoric about God. And then Augustine realized that it was already impious to use finite human marks and sounds to praise an infinite being entirely separate from those finite marks and sounds. So he was driven to silence. If one were to take that same picture of language without the thought of developing a rhetoric of God, but left just with the finite marks and sounds and no inner teacher, Christ the inner teacher to tell us when our signs worked and when our words referred, then we would have a language that operates by disseminating meaning, by moving meaning, by shifting it. So if you were to have, for example, Derrida criticize Habermas, Habermas would say, say something like this. He would go, understanding is a condition for our linguistic practices. Derrida would respond, if that is so, then so is misunderstanding equally constitutive. Because understanding won't make sense conceptually unless misunderstanding does. They are correlatives. Does that make, well, I hope that makes sense. I mean, I'm asking a rhetorical question now about a philosopher who does rhetoric, but anyway, as well as argument. Uh, so that, that, that's, these are the kind of things that irritate people. Uh, in addition, and this is, I think, uh, you know, I, I, the take on language that he has. Uh, basically, words can always misrefer. They can always misrefer. Our meanings can always go astray. Even when we point, this is the most simple example analytic philosophers use, I can say, get me that cup there. And you could still pick up this one instead of this one. Pointing won't even guarantee a reference. And if it's possible to misrefer, if it's possible to misread, if it's possible to misunderstand, then it belongs to that structure I've called language to do those things because a possibility once is a necessity forever. Let me say that again. A possibility once, when we speak in structural terms, is a necessity forever. This is what makes original sin so interesting. Human beings who don't sin are still sinners in the Christian tradition because the possibility once is the necessity forever. The possibility once is the necessity forever. Now, these are subtle views. Derrida is frequently caricatured for these views. We would all like to hold theories of meaning that made fundamental experiences like pointing, what meaning was about, and so on. Uh, but I don't think Derrida's views lead to, the, 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 what I'd like to give you now is what I would call the upshot of some of the views, and I don't think they're that outrageous. 
The upshot, as I've said, is that there will be no final interpretations in philosophy. And I think the history of metaphysics bears that out, the history of philosophy. There will be no last books. Even the Bible wasn't the last book. I wonder how many commentaries have been written on it. There will be no last books, no final commentaries, no ends to the flows of information. Meaning is not fixable or fixed even humanly in a certain way. Since we speak the language of metaphysics in a certain sense, I've already talked about potentiality, appearance, and so on, in a strange way, language has a power to operate in the radical absence of man. I used the example of my own death in the laundry in the uh, list for my wife, but uh, there, are, there are many other examples. You find, as it were, a monument in stone, and you can decipher the cuneiform, and that form of man, again, the ideological term, has disappeared for ages of time. But the words as materiality still can be interpreted, not finally, but they still have their effects. Their effects. Uh, now, to some of the political upshot of Derrida and why I think he does outrage people. Looking at, uh, uh, at philosophical language as metaphorical, largely metaphorical, in fact, if you understood what I've just said about Derrida, you'll see that the sense in which it's frequently said that for Derrida, all words are metaphorical. By that, he means that no word is the thing. The word horse is not a horse. The word cat is not a cat. The word neutrino is not itself a neutrino. There are some exceptions, but not really. The wor is the word word a word? No, because I have mentioned it and not used it. It's now become a token of a word. So <laughs> what I'm trying to say here is that words are not things. That the attempt that philosophers have made to hook words to the world has failed but it's no cause for anyone to think that we're not talking about anything. So it just doesn't make the world disappear. It just makes language into the muddy, material, somewhat confused practice that it actually is. Or that at least, according to Derrida, it actually is. Now here's some of the upshot of it that I think has caused people to be upset. Not only this business about better and worse readings, which people go, well, what's a better reading of something? Damn it, nothing means anything anymore. Uh, the, these are some of the things that upset them. Uh, everything can't be a metaphor. I mean, sometimes I mean what I say, damn it, and I just mean it. I mean, these kind of frustrated remarks by professors who've been around a long time. Uh, the most irritating thing of all, and, and I think I'll read a short passage if I have time. Am I running? I think, I think my time's running okay. I'll take a very short passage because it's particularly irritating. Uh, in, in his article, White Mythology, Derrida uh, makes a point about the metaphorical nature of philosophical language. And I think he makes it in a rather humorous way. He uses a story from Anatole France, in which Anatole France is, uh, is giving an analysis of a philosophical passage, and he takes the following passage. Anatole France does. Derrida's just discussing it. Wherefore I was on the right road uh, when I investigated this sentence, and here's the sentence investigated by Anatole France. The spirit possesses God in proportion as it participates in the absolute. I think that's actually a sentence from Hegel. Now, Anatole France goes on to say, it was important to see that these words were signs that had as it were, changed meanings and shifted through time. It was important that we were able to do a translation. The spirit possesses God in proportion as it participates in the absolute. What is this, if not a collection of little symbols, much worn and defaced, I admit, symbols which have lost their original brilliance, how they must have sounded maybe in Greece, or maybe even in 19th century Germany. 
the original brilliance, and picturesqueness, but which still, by the nature of things, remain symbols. And I have been able, without sacrificing fidelity, to substitute one for the other, to, to as it were, update this into a more modern. And, and, and in this way, I've arrived at the following translation. The breath is seated on the shining one in the bushel of the part it takes in what is altogether loosed or subtle. And then we get the next step of translation. He whose breath is a sign of life, man that is, we will find a place, no doubt after the breath has been exhaled, in the divine fire, source and home of life, and this place will be meted out to him according to the virtue that has been given him by demons, I imagine, of sending abroad his warm breath, this little invisible soul, across the free expanse, the blue sky, most likely. And now observe, says Anatole France, and now observe, the phrase has acquired quite the ring of some fragment of a Vedic hymn, just by returning it to sort of its original meanings of absolute, <laughs> God and so on, just by returning it to those meanings when they had their brilliance and their sort of life time. As now it sounds like a Vedic hymn, it even smacks of ancient oriental mythology. I cannot say that I've restored this myth in full accordance with the strict laws that govern all language, but no matter for that, enough if we have found that symbols in a myth in a sentence that was always essentially mythical and symbolic in as much as it was metaphysical. I think I've tried to make you realize one thing, Anatole France says, that any expression of an abstract idea can only be by analogy or metaphor. Can only be by analogy or metaphor. By an odd fate, the very metaphysicians who think to escape the world of appearance are constrained to it perpetually by allegory, metaphor, and analogy. They are a sorry lot of poets, a sorry lot of poets. They dim the colors of their ancient fables, and they are themselves but the gatherers of fables. They produce white mythology. Now Derrida comments, a formula, brief, condensed, economical, and mute has been deployed in an interminably explicative discourse. The derisive effect which is always produced by the translation of anything occidental into the oriental ideograph. Anyway, that's supposed to be funny to really, you know, like funny types of people, academics mainly, but they didn't find it amusing because in the history of philosophy, it's a hard, uh, it, it is the beginning of an argument that many of these words are words, I said being, if we went back, would be God, if we took that word back far enough, it would be the breath of the great beast of the east, took that back, it would probably be the tree that stands the tallest, and so on. Once we've translated all that out, we do have kind of a Vedic hymn. And uh, philosophy, according to Derrida, is doomed, as it were, if you want doomed to be the word, I think it actually can be playful. And Derrida is a witty about it. It's not sad to him that philosophy cannot become finally a great science or anything. They are doomed to be a more or less sorry lot of poets. I mean, it, the, better, the better the poet, the better the wit, the better the philosophy in some cases for Derrida. He clearly is, likes a good joke. And part of the last argument that I it's not an argument, it is an economical statement, mute, and so on, is it's supposed to be a joke too. But then the political intent is clear underneath it. If philosophy is white mythology, what's to keep us from teaching other mythologies at the university? Like women's mythologies, and black mythologies, and Hispanic mythologies, and oriental mythologies. I hope you're beginning to see why Derrida began to upset people. If this was true, it wouldn't mean that white mythologies had lost their interest or that they weren't profound and worthy of study. 
but it would mean they were no more so than black mythology, Hispanic mythology, women's mythology. If I were to look for examples of Derrida's marginality of the spoken or the written word, the trace, the grammy, the many, and I've left out many sophistications here, who cares? I'm not French, I don't eat souffles, forget it. I'm trying to get this across in the spirit of that Chicago Tribune article. This is the disturbing part to academics, is it opens up this road within which many other mythologies, if you will, can be spoken with equal right, with equal right, as the dominant ones have been in the past. And uh, I think that that is not at all a bad effect that Derrida's had. The fact that he has a sense of humor, I don't hold against him. I wish more academics did. I think it's pedagogically useful not to be a damn bore all the time and just, you know, put people to sleep is pedagogically useful. After all, you know, professors and lecturers have to compete with MTV, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Jurassic Park, so I hardly think it's in our interest to be boring. And uh, that, that's one thing Derrida certainly is not. And it's nice to encounter in the dark days that lay ahead as I uh, trudge through and, and what a self can be, it's nice to encounter a playful spirit Derrida is very troubled about what the self might even be. But he is troubled in the playful way that Nietzsche is troubled when he's at his best. And uh, so uh, I, I hope that I could at least interest you in uh, looking at something of Derrida's. I, in fact, I'll leave you with, with, with one last little joke of Derrida's. So much work has been spent and so much time has been spent interpreting Nietzsche, and now, of course, paradoxically, Derrida, because these things go on and on, uh, that he wrote a little book called Spurs, Nietzsche's Style. And in it, he makes, uh, he, he imagines that Nietzsche left behind, among his many papers, a little scrap of paper that says, I forgot my umbrella. Then Derrida goes through a long, complex way that an academic interpreter would try to fit this brilliant aphroism of Nietzsche's into the body of his work. I mean, after all, it might just mean I forgot my umbrella, but on the other hand. And, of course, by the time, and, and this is a short little book that I think you could enjoy, by the time that Derrida is finished, I think that one has at least learned to be an interpreter with more grace and with a little bit more poetry. And perhaps it would free us for richer, more multicultural, more diverse, and more humane interpretations if we could free ourselves from the myth, the invidious myth, that there is a right way to read a book, one. A right civilization to belong to as though we chose it a right gender to be as though we could pick it, a right class to belong to as though we chose those things, a right race to be, a certain mythology preferable to others, as in white, which according to some African-American scholars today, and so far as it's Greek, <laughs> was stolen from the Africans in the first place. We don't, I don't know if that's true or not, but it's certainly an interesting conjecture, and it's one in which the readings and the battles of interpretation, as Derrida points out, will not stop. There won't be a last book, and I'm afraid that also warns you that in this class, as in many others, there won't be a last word. Thank you very much. <laughs>